Hey YouTube, Joe here. So I thought it might be fun if we did a little bit of a uh, review over my current kegerator. I had received uh, several messages from folks and uh, realized I never really did an update video uh, about my new kegerator. It's been, oh my goodness, it's been a couple years almost now uh, since I upgraded to this bigger. It's a four tap kegerator. Got my cool skull opener here and then my, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Beauty is in the eye of the beer holder opener, which is full of caps, as you can see. Lots of two brothers. Love two brothers. But, um, yeah, didn't really do an update uh, when I did this changeover. You know, I remember actually taking pictures throughout the process because, you know, I thought it would be cool to show here on YouTube, but never uploaded it. Uh, one, I forgot, but also, uh, it wasn't very linear. I had one, I, you know, I kind of... I don't know, I kind of cobbled this thing together, you know, <laughs> kind of winged it. And um, and so, yeah, never really did a full-on update about this. So, thought I would show you guys, see what's going on uh, with the kegerator side here. You can see we did the Raspberry Lime Cider. This is uh, from the uh, Cider House Select series from uh, Brewer's Best. Um, it's one of the lines we carry at BIY Homebrew Supply. And uh, really, really nice stuff. Um, you get a nice cider flavor, but when you take a sip of it, the, the kind of berry zing, you know, hits you. Yeah, nice bright flavor. And, uh, oh, you can hear it just kicked on. So, uh, so yeah, I figured we would do a little uh, look through the kegerator here, show you what's going on, and, uh, you know, maybe it'll be a good inspiration for folks looking to, you know, maybe transform their own freezer, you know, into a, a keezer, I guess I say a kegerator. Keyser, I guess is more so what it is. Um, so yeah, looking on the front here, you can see the four taps. The uh, uh, board here I painted in um, chalkboard paint, so I can write on it with chalk. Um, wherever you know, whenever I do an update, it's really easy. You just wipe it off with a wet paper towel, dry that off, write on your new one, you're ready to roll. Um, all shanks and um, you know your standard faucets. One of these days, hopefully, I will be able to afford the Perlic Pearls. That would be lovely. <laughs> but until then, I'm happy with my standard faucets. Um, so standard faucets with your black poles. Um, your shanks with the, uh, the standard black flanges on them. Um, chalkboard paint, I always keep chalk over there by the uh, VCR, which I'm sure you can see there. We've got some hops some maple syrup and some grain there. I may have a brewing video coming up very soon, uh, as long as everything goes well. Uh, so yeah, so that's the outside of it here. We'll move you around, show you the other side, show you our temperature controller, and then we will dig into the actual cooler. So let me move the camera. Should probably have another uh, swig of cider, right? Eh? So this side here is the uh, actual temperature controller. This wire here is actually to my fermentation chamber, so we'll get that out of the way there. But uh, this is the box that does all the magic. It's a standard Johnson digital temperature controller. This line here is my temperature probe that goes inside the actual kegerator, so that's monitoring the temperature. And then the uh, freezer itself is plugged into this, and then this is plugged into the wall here. Um, so the way that these digital uh, thermostats work is they monitor the temperature of whatever you've got the probe attached to and then we'll flick on uh, in this instance it's a single stage so it'll only control cooling or will only control heating we've got it programmed to do cooling um, so it's monitoring the temperature once the temperature reaches a certain point it kicks on you can see it's glowing green it kicks on the freezer to start chilling everything and then once it hits the bottom of its threshold it kicks off so rather than cycling the freezer over and over and over again, um, it takes care of everything right here. It, uh, you know, as long as we sealed everything, so as long as um, you know it's not a really really weird hot day, or you know the air conditioner's not kicking on and freezing us down here in the basement, or cooking us, you know, over and over and over again, it's very steady. It only kicks on a couple times a day. Um, so yeah, the Johnson Digital Temperature Controller. We do have those at BIY. They are awesome, well worth the money, and the digital, in my opinion, is well uh, worth the upgrade from the analog versions of the same thing. Uh, much more precise, um, 
dials in the temperature perfectly. I've never ever had a problem with this unit. So very, very good. So, so yeah, so again, this is the probe, the temperature probe going into the, the keyser here. Oh, just kicked off, you can see. Uh, let's see where we at. 35, nice and chilly in there. I've got a Czech Pills, an IPA, a Scottish, and the Raspberry Lime, so keeping everything nice and chilly in there. Uh, but you can set it to whatever you want, of course. Um, uh, so yeah, plug the keyser into it, plug it into the wall, set your probe, done. Let's take a look on the inside now. So I hope you can see this okay, but now we've just opened the lid. So here is the lid. We opened it for you here. And uh, so so this is the inside of the kegerator. We wound up, uh, I like to keep the CO2 tank on the inside here. There's a little hose for my beer gun. Um, here's the regulator. Um, five pounder with a, just a single, um, gosh, a single line regulator. I guess not a dual regulator, but your standard single regulator. Feeding up into our manifold here, six-way manifold. I've got four lines set to the four different kegs. Um, there would be our pills, there would be our IPA, there would be our scotch, and there is our cider. Um, so yeah, so I keep everything on the same pressure. Now some folks will have a dual regulator, you know, sending it out, you know, different lines, maybe you're force carbing one thing, maybe you're uh, you know, one thing that needs to be, you know, higher serving pressure to maintain your, you know, line balance or, you know, and you've got low balance things. You know, everyone's keg rate is going to be a little bit different and a lot of it has to do with what you like to serve. I don't like a whole lot of high, you know, CO2, super fizzy things. So for me, a little bit lower pressure works great. I've got everything set to about 10 PSI. Um, that's typically where I like to carbonate and where this system seems to fall so things aren't, you know, foaming up too, too much. Um, the IPA and the pills, I actually carved at 12 PSI and I've been serving at 10 and they foam like crazy. So I should have just carved them at 10 knowing that I like a little lower CO2 levels anyway. Um, you know, and just, uh, you know, let them sit at that. So, so our gas comes in, it's distributed out. We've got four lines. I've got one line here that uh, is obviously, these are closed, these are open. Lovely thing about these manifolds, you can tell what is what. It's very easy to control them. Um, I keep this line open typically just to purge things or if I need to attach anything to the barb to say, you know, force, you know, I don't know, blow something out or, you know, whatever. Um, and the sixth line here I always keep attached. This is my beer gun line. Um, I've been bottling several things with uh, the beer gun as of late, Blickman's beer gun. And so, yeah, I always, uh, I just, you know, clamped it on there and I've had no reason to take it off. So in the event I need to purge a line or something, it's easy to, you know, just shut this off and bleed the CO2 out of the system. These are check valves, so these lines will always stay pressurized. Nothing can go backwards in these, so um, no backwards pressure, which is cool. Um, that's the only thing we sell at my homebrew shop, you know. Why mess around with it? Get the best you can get. Um, so distributors heading into the kegs of course and then the beverage connectors are heading up into our shanks now I know the shanks are a little hard to see but you can see kind of the tail end of them here we've got the four going through the um, it's a 2 by 12 so these are 2 by 12 so, you know 2 by 12 um, that I just seated right on the top of the uh, freezer um, so Gas into the manifold, manifold to the kegs, kegs to the beverage system, and then out to the different shanks. And then the shanks come through right to the front where you saw that had the uh, faucets and the, the tap handles on it. Um, kind of a basic setup. You can kind of see here on this far side here is where the um, line for the uh, thermostat goes into. So kind of drilled out a little section here. It's just in the corner here. Just kind of shaved off a little area for that little wire to run and then we just drop it down to the bottom because I found that if you keep that thermostat on the top of the kegs here, um, it's going to be measuring from up here where there's some ambient uh, you know, warmth or stuff, you know, coming in from the wood or from the edges or whatever. Um, and I could line this with uh, insulation and make it more insulated, but honestly, the trick 
just keep it on the bottom. If you keep it up on the top, it's going to think that it's warmer in there than it actually is, and the freezer is going to kick on more often than it needs to, and you're going to freeze your kegs. I am speaking from experience on that one. Um, I was absolutely dumbfounded, realized I left a coil, the coiled up thermometer right on the top there, and, and boom, froze my line. So put it back on the bottom, two days later, everything was flowing just fine. So I just keep the probe at the very, very bottom of the kegerator there. Um, this uh, freezer does have a drain. It's way far down there. It's really hard to see uh, from your perspective and even from mine. There's a keg sitting on it, this one. <laughs> but uh, you can drain it out if there's excess condensation in there, um, which is nice, you know, if you do end up having a, uh, you know, just build up a condensation. It's been really humid here. It's July in Iowa, so the humidity's through the roof, and uh, yeah, to have that uh, ability to drain it out in the need, you know, if you need to, all your kegs are sitting there sweating from, you know, any ambient anything getting in here, um, from keeping it open like this, uh, it is handy to have that. Um, so, not sure, let's see, yep, you can see from here, so like here, I have caulked everything with a, um, what, what is it? It's like an adhesive, caulk, glue, all-in-one substance. <laughs> I don't know what it was. But um, same stuff that I used to actually glue the 2x12s to the kegerator top. So ran those beads of the uh, adhesive caulk across the edge, set the whole thing down, um, put weights on it, made sure that it sat for, gosh, it was probably two or three days, and then uh, pulled it off, sealed everything, reattached the lid, installed the manifold there, and, you know, I was up and running. Didn't take very long to build. Um, honestly, all the kegs and all, all these, you know, nice pieces of hardware were a little expensive, but I think that a nice kegerator like this is one that you invest in once, and I mean, it's been operating two years, knock on wood, um, flawlessly. Never had a problem. The only problem had been user error, where I overcarb stuff and, you know, wind up having to um, either depressurize a keg or, you know, just deal with the foam. Like right now, those two that are a little foamy, I'm just dealing with the foam. I'm not going to worry about it. Keeping everything at 10 PSI, I'm not going to worry about it. So, so yeah, so that's the inside of the kegerator here. You can see CO2, line to the manifold, manifold to the kegs, kegs to the serving apparatus. Um, you could certainly take the same type of thing, lower it a little bit. I gave myself plenty of room so that way I wasn't squishing this keg over here. Uh, if I pull this CO2 tank out and kind of shimmy things over and put a block underneath this fourth keg to the far right, I could actually fit five kegs in here. Um, I'm probably not going to do that. Four is more than enough for me. And uh, I'm kind of a fan of minimal hose length. So I've got five foot sections on all my beverage lines and then three foot sections on all the gas lines. Um, yeah, I, I've seen some that are all kind of like spaghetti monstered and uh, that would just cause too much of a problem for me. So, so yeah, so there's the inside of the cake grater. I hope that helps to uh, kind of show you how mine is set up. Definitely an upgrade from the uh, the two keg jammed in their uh, dorm mini fridge, huh? <laughs> so there you go YouTube, a little bit of a tour of it, uh, you know, into my new kegerator here. I guess I shouldn't say new, it's not that new, but new to YouTube. Um, <coughs> I planned on posting more of like a how-to, but it wound up, you know, so many things are changing and I was like re configuring things as we went through the process that I was like, this is not really going to be a very linear how-to, so it's, it may not be useful to folks, so I kind of scrapped it. But I did take a whole bunch of pictures, and I'll, uh, I don't know, do a little slideshow here after I wrap up. But, um, so, so yeah, four, four faucet keg reader here, uh, very basic, you've got your standard shanks, four and a half inch, uh, or say, four faucets, and then four standard four and a half inch shanks connected to five foot of beverage hose to the beverage ball lock attaches to your keg then you got your gas disconnect run into the manifold and then the manifold running into the uh, five pound co2 tank that i keep in the kegerator um, some folks will have you know a preference to having it out of the kegerator honestly i i've noticed that when i run out of gas in this setup um, 
if I take it out and let it, you know, warm up to, you know, room temperature and then I open up the valve, you know, it blows out CO2 at a moderately high pressure for uh, five seconds, ten seconds. It's really not that much to worry about how the chilled tank is going to cause, you know, lower pressure than if it was actually at room temperature. If it's not, if that's a concern for you though, if you've got a bigger system or, you know, you, you just don't want to deal with it, Put the CO2 on the outside, drill a hole through your, uh, through the board, run your gas line, done, you know, put some caulk around the edge there and then you've got it sealed. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that, that's, that's how I did this one. It was kind of impromptu. I built it as I felt and, uh, you know, it works great. I've loved it. I've used it, like I said, for, gosh, it's been a year and a half or two years now or so. I, I don't even remember. It's... <laughs> Well, let's see, we've been in this house for coming up on two years, so I guess it's been, it was the first thing I built when I got to this house, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so it worked out great. Um, if there's anything in this little walkthrough that you've got questions about, please do leave a message down in the comment section. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Um, if you are looking for any of these components, we sell them all at my shop, biyhomebrewsupply.com. Um, happy to get you set up with it, and anything, if you need a customized setup, let us know. We can order that for you, too. Um, but yeah, overall, it's really not that hard to do. It's a little expensive to get started. I did have to buy my um, uh, the freezer here new. There were not any available on Craigslist, and when they were, it, you know, gone. So I didn't even have a chance. So I was like, I'll just go to Sam's Club. Just pick one up. So it was, you know, gosh, what? 180 bucks, I think, 190 bucks, somewhere around there. Um, all these faucets are economy faucets, so they're 25 bucks each. The shanks were 23 bucks each. You got your line and connectors and then kegs these days. Gosh, the corny kegs keep going up in price, so I don't even know what they're going to be tomorrow, let alone, I don't even remember how much they were when I got them. Manifold CO2 tank, of course, is completely dependent upon your location. We sell the manifolds. Um, and they all have the check valve installed, which I highly recommend. It allows gas to go through, but nothing to get backwards. So don't cheap out on your manifold. Get a good one so that way you save your regulator in the event there's back pressure. Um, and then your CO2 tank is going to depend upon your local area. That's the one thing we don't have at the shop. Uh, just because here, here in Iowa, there are uh, several locations to get good CO2 tanks and refills and all that. So we don't even bother with it. We let, we let the experts handle that. Um, so yeah, overall, a little bit of an investment, but once you've got it, I tell you, you just don't go back. <laughs> um, I've had to, I've been teaching some college courses um, at the local community college of homebrewing, and uh, or in homebrewing, not of homebrewing. How, how cool would that be? A community college of homebrew. Um, anyway, local college teaching uh, homebrew classes, and uh, we cover you know, the whole gamut really. And so when you're looking at the uh, bringing samples to class per se, or you know, when I, when I want to bottle up a beer or something for friends or something, having it force carved in the keg, I know it's clear, I know that it's carbonated correctly, I use my Blickman beer gun to fill those bottles up, cap them, and it's done. I only have to sanitize and clean as many bottles as I plan to share with people which is not a lot. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, so I thought I'd just, uh, you know, kind of go over my thing. Oh, one thing that you can't really see. So I've got my four tabbers here. You'll notice no drip tray. On the floor there is a 24 inch stainless steel drip tray designed for like a countertop. I just set it right on the floor and it works great. I'll, I'll focus you down. Here we go. Let's see here. Pardon the dogger. Right there it is. So you can see there's my four faucets and right there's the big old drip tray. And the cool part about that is it's, it, you know, it's not attached to anything so I can take it. It's stainless steel. I throw it in the dishwasher and boom, clean as a whistle. I hope that's lined back up. I don't have a way to test it. <laughs> so. Cheers, YouTube. Thanks for watching, as always. Uh, if you've got any questions again on this or you need any supplies, give us a call, shoot us an email. Happy to help. Um, but yeah, it, it really is worth the investment. 
Um, I would recommend maybe buying your used uh, corny kegs sooner rather than later. They just seem to keep going up in price. When we first started selling them, they were 60 bucks. Now we're up to 89. The big online shops, you know who I'm talking about, 100 bucks a pop for a used keg. So get in now while you can. And uh, you know, if, if BIY can do anything for you, we are absolutely happy to help. So uh, without, uh, without further ado, we'll let you go. Cheers. Thanks for watching. Um, if you haven't tried one of these Cider House Select kits, so good and so easy. I, we almost always have, this fourth tapper is almost always a cider. And then when it's not a cider, I'm not using it. <laughs> so, ah, yeah, it's good. And also keep tuned for uh, the uh, upcoming, I've got a couple brewing videos coming your way. Uh, Nick and I are getting married in September. So I've got to be making some beer for the festivities. So without further ado, cheers YouTube. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.